But as we always do, um, and as we always do, as I should say, we conduct a land acknowledgement before we get started. And that is, we honor the land as the creator intended in that we commit to keep it clean and support efforts to make it safe for all. We can show honor to the native keepers of the land by recognizing the value of their culture, by learning the truth of their history and how it shaped this great country. So I know that you're all here to hear our great speaker and I am as excited as you are, if not more so. I had an opportunity to hear him speak at a conference and I'm telling you, I couldn't wait to make my way to him. It took a while for me to get to him, but I got to him because of the other folks that was trying to get to him. Um, because I knew he was someone that we could learn a lot from. And he does a really great job in talking about this topic of culture. So um, what we have today, and these are his words and I'm using them is does diversity and inclusion exist without cultural intelligence? His response to that was the short answer is no. Cultural intelligence is not the only strategy for supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion work. There are actually several critical components, but cultural intelligence is foundational and it's critical part of any process designed to create a diverse, inclusive, an equitable environment. And this is what we're asking and it's going on to read on. Organizations can have employees from a wide range of diverse cultures and backgrounds, as well as gender, identities, races, nationalities, generations, differently abled people and on and on and still not understand how to leverage those differences. This is gonna be a conversation today where you're gonna learn about those things and you're gonna learn them from an amazing presenter. Our presenter today is Carlos Kadaginan. I'm gonna get it right, is a certified cultural intelligence consultant who helps individuals and organizations improve their capability to function effectively in a cultural context with over 20 years of experience leading successful, diverse and inclusive teams, Carlos has turned his passion for developing and coaching people into an inclusive leadership consulting company called the CQ Mindset. Without further ado, I am now yielding the floor over to Carlos. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Fanny. Thank you, Elijah. Thanks everyone for having me and, and happy new year. Uh, it's great to see the comments. I'm glad people got to pick up a book and spend time with family and were able to kind of de de uh, decompress, disconnect a little bit, hopefully, and got some rest. So again, uh, thank you so much, uh, Fanny and Elijah for having me and thank you everyone for allowing me to speak today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, if that's okay. Uh, and once I do, I'm not gonna be able to see anyone's faces. Um, so if you have any questions or comments, I think Elijah's got that all figured out. Um, but let me know, um, hopefully with some thumbs up or through Elijah or Fanny, if all you see is my screen that says cultural values. Looking good. Looking, looking good. Okay, great. Awesome. So let's, let's get started. So again, uh, thank you for the introduction, Fanny. That makes me sound um, so much better than I think that I am. Uh, my name is Carlos Cadigan. I am talking to you today from... Uh, actually probably have a similar, similar weather. I'm calling you today from just outside of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And I had the pleasure of meeting Fanny in San Diego at a conference uh, a few months ago, which um, she mentioned earlier. So uh, I am a certified intelligent, uh, cultural intelligence consultant. Uh, I have a, a small boutique practice with my wife who usually sits behind me uh, there. And we started this um, uh, a few years ago um, really to to really help organizations and communities and individuals uh, work effectively um, in, in their communication and working with people who are different than them. Uh, we thought it was important. Um, we have two small kids. Um, and over the last 10 years, I'd say, there's been some uh, changes in our culture that's been a little uh, disheartening. Uh, the way we talk to each other, the way we view each other, the way we 
um, uh, talk around each other and through each other. And so we thought, what can we do uh, for our kids and for ourselves and for other people to to hopefully create an environment where we actually have dialogue again um, and uh, in a respectful and meaningful way. So we started this thing called CQ Mindset. And our real purpose, uh, frankly, is to meet people where they are without any judgment. And we mean it. And so um, I'm willing to talk to anybody about anything. And I think it's important that uh, we find ways to collaborate um, and find common grounds uh, and support each other. So that's why we started it. So uh, I appreciate being here today. And thank you so much for having me. Um, now let's stop talking about, well, now I'm going to talk about me some more here. So uh, what my bio doesn't say, um, I have a picture here uh, of a couch with plastic on it. Um, and um this symbolizes for me how I got into this work. Um, so I'll tell a real a quick story. Uh, I, like I said, I'm from Toronto, uh, Canada. My parents migrated here in the seventies from Barbados. Um, and at that time, uh, both in America and Canada and the UK, there was this need for healthcare workers. And so people from Barbados and other small islands would, would migrate over to these countries. Most of my family either stay, is still in Barbados. Some went to the UK, some went to even in New York, Queens, Brooklyn, shout out. Um, but my parents landed in Toronto. And um, when we moved here, we moved to this small uh, suburb town of Toronto called Scarborough. And it was a real melting pot of diverse people. Uh, when I was a child, if I had 10 friends, maybe two of them were black. The other eight were Macedonian and Greek and Jewish and Italian and South Asian and East Asian. And so what it gave me was um, to say that it really colored my world. Um, I was able to experience my parents' culture. I was also born here in Canada. So I'm Canadian, but then I have this Bayesian influence. And then I had all these friends who were from diverse uh, areas. So I could be eating rice and peas and oxtail with my parents. And then I would go over to my friend South who's South Asian and just walk in and just smell, smell spices everywhere. And then I go to my Greek friend's house and there'd be all these pastries and things that I never experienced. And so it really colored my, my experience in my life. But there were still things that I thought were inherently uh I guess, black, uh, because my parents moved here, they didn't have a huge network of people. So we go to these you know, Caribbean uh, festivals and picnics and everyone's house we went to who was black had plastic on their furniture. So as a small kid, when I was born in 77, so I just aged myself there um, and growing up in the eighties, I thought it was a, a black thing until one of my friends who's Italian got a Nintendo. So back in, for those who are old enough, back in around 85, 86, the Nintendo came out. Before that, there was Atari, which was a great, you know, video game system, but it was just one joystick and one red button. But then here come Nintendo with these amazing graphics, Mario Brothers. And so my parents couldn't afford to get one, but my friend did. So I want to go over there and play it. So I went over to his house and his Nintendo was set up in the basement. So I walk into his house, I had his mom, you know, she sends me something to eat. You can't refuse a, an Italian woman. She offers you something to eat, so you got to take it. And then as I was walking through the house, I noticed he had a couch with plastic on it. And he paused, he turned around, he's like, let's go. We're going to the basement. Let's go play some Mario Brothers. But I was so fixated on this couch that had plastic on it. And he, I could tell in that moment that he looked in my eyes and recognized something else was going on. And I said, hold on a second. You, you put plastic on your furniture? And he said, yeah. And then he recognized that I was feeling something. And he said, do you do, do your parents do that as well? And that was my first kind of um, connection point of, yes, I love to celebrate the differences between all of us. And, and I think it's important. We all have differences, but there's so much more that connects us. And if you think about the world now, you think about news and social media and everything it's everything seems to be around what can divide people and split us into camps into groups and this is one of those moments in my life uh, very early in my life that I realized yes we are very different but there are these things that connect us and it went deeper than that you know his parents would make like my mom uh, would cook more food the people who actually live in the house there's always leftovers right yeah food was a way of showing love to family and to other people uh, you both couldn't refuse my mother or, or an Italian mother of their food. You gotta, you're taking it. She's like, I'm offering you something. You must take it. All those things are very similar. Um, but um, as you get older, you realize that people would try to dredge uh, wedges between us, black people, Italian, Italians, and 
Jewish people, but it doesn't matter. We find all these things that are different about us, but there's these things that we have these common grounds in. So that's why I wanted to share this story. That's why I started it, um, is because I, I remember what it was like to grow up in an area that was very diverse and how it colored my world. And I'm hoping to bring that forward um, for other people who might not have that same opportunity or had that opportunity, but as life kind of goes along and kind of beats you up, you might forget about those things that, that connect us. So uh, thanks for letting me share that quick story. So what are we gonna do today? Um, I got about an hour of your time. And I want to talk about a couple of things that I, I think that you might find interesting. So we're going to talk a little bit about why uh, we believe um, that culture matters, especially when we talk about DEI work, which is the next point. Uh, I don't think you could have a like, successful diversity, equity, inclusion initiative in an organization, in a community without um, self-awareness, curiosity, and empathy. And I believe those are the, the tenets to me of cultural intelligence. And so how do we skill people, whether they're leaders, individual contributors, members of a community to recognize their own cultural values, but more importantly, or just as important, notice other people's cultural values and how they differ so we can figure out ways to communicate and talk to each other. Um, the other thing we're gonna talk about is what are cultural values? Uh, we're gonna talk about that a little bit today. How does culture help and understanding culture help us with our biases? I'm not going to go into a deep dive of biases here, but um, I, I want to touch a little bit about that. And then at the end, obviously talk about um, what is what is um, cultural intelligence as a whole. Um, like Fanny said, uh, I'm a big cultural intelligence pro proponent. I'm also certified in emotional intelligence. Those two things for me are the bookends of my life, just like music. If someone said to me, what bookends your love of music? For me, I have two bookends, and it's probably my age as well. I'm 45. It's probably Prince and Michael Jackson. Uh, to me, when, it, when I think about inclusive leadership, if I had to put it on my shelf and put it in a bookend, inclusive leadership would be in the middle, and the two ends of those would be emotional intelligence and cultural intelligence. Um, and they're both very important. So I would never advocate, you know, one's more important than the other. But I think cultural intelligence takes off or emotional intelligence leaves off, which is how do we effectively work and communicate with people who are probably different than us? Um, and so I think it's a really important skill to have if you're really looking to create psychological safety in your workforce or create uh, an inclusive uh, working environment. Um, some ground rules really quickly. Um, I know no one's really talking and I know it's not really an open sharing forum, but I know there's gonna be questions at the end. Uh, when I talk about DEI, usually what happens is, is I'm on a screen like this, I come into a call, um, depending on the ethnicity or, or the people or the country that I'm speaking to, uh, they see a black guy in a microphone and I see a lot of shoulders that are like this, like we're talking about DEI and here's a black guy, what's gonna happen here? Um, but what I want to tell you is, uh, is the same thing about our tagline. I believe in meeting people where they are. This is an open space. I think everyone should be comfortable to be able to share, respect each other. Um, we all come from different cultural values, different perspectives. It's okay. We only get better with dialogue. And so I would like to set the ground rules that this is a safe space. <laughs> there's no repercussions for anyone asking a certain question or not understanding something. And there's no silly questions to be asked. You're not going to offend me. And so I just want everyone to feel safe. Is there any other ground rules? Uh, please feel free to share those with, with Elijah. You can share them with me, but I just want to make sure that everyone understands it's a, a safe place. There's, there's no judgment here. We're just really trying to figure out a way to, to work together better. Okay. Um, so let's, let's, let's get right into it. So I'm sorry, I'm going to move my uh, zoom bar, which is like, it's covering things. Perfect. Okay. So why does culture matter, Carlos? So, okay. So when you think about culture, I think much like race, um, or DI, I should say, we go to like these default settings in our minds. Someone says DI, probably talking about black people versus why we're talking about men versus women. Yes, and all those things are true, but there's so much more to diversity than that. Diversity has dimensions. Those dimensions include age, gender, religion, political affiliation, your the way you like to learn, job function, social economic class. So diverse, diversity isn't just about black and white and, men, and, and male versus female. And it's the same thing for culture. Culture isn't just the way I pray and my skin tone. Those things are in that, but there's other things. And so the work that we do and when we talk to people, we talk about, yes, culture across the borders because our borders now we've become a globalized uh, society in a lot of ways um in the 80s when i grew up i didn't know anyone who went to africa frankly unless they were african maybe if your mom or dad was a doctor or something but now people just go to africa because it's tuesday and so our, our availability to move around the world interact with people has changed tremendously plus with that we have uh 
a lot of diversity in, in, in our society, people moving in, coming to our country, just like we all did from other places. And so how do we work effectively? Yes, across borders, but also how do you work effectively within our borders? So again, you could be working here and talking to a family who's got a child in school and, but that family just got here five years ago and their cultural values are very different, even though they're Canadian now, or even though they're American now, their history, the way they view things, love, communication, uh, showing affection, those things are different than ours. And so um, how do we deal with that? Also, I like to say, there's also cultural values within our borders. So you could be in New York and have a way about doing work, which is much different than someone who's in Texas or in California or up in Maine. And so cultural values and culture is, is not just tied to someone's ethnicity and where they pray. It's how they were raised and they're brought up in their communities, on their streets, in those states that they live in. Okay. So it's really about bridging all of those things. Organizations have cultures. Okay. So an organization could say we are you know, inclusive and invite everyone to come in. And that's great. And I believe that they try to do that. But as we all know, depending on where you are in that organization, the way the culture feels is different. The way the culture is in finance versus someone in technology versus someone who is in uh, customer facing versus someone who is not, it's very different. What role you have in an organization, am I an individual contributor or am I a leader, is very, very different. So organizations have their own culture. So when I hear the words, we're hiring for culture fit, I get very tense when I hear those words because most people don't even know what their culture actually is in their organization. There's the tenants that you aspire to, but is that what is being felt on the front line? It's usually not. And so it's really before you go and hire for cultural fit, you need to actually understand what your culture is. Um, and again, it's not malicious. I don't think anyone does this by design. It's just, we just don't know. And you only know by being curious and asking questions and trying to have perspective taking. So uh, it's really important. The other thing that's to talk about is in our organization, there's, there's more generations working together than ever. And so what works for me as a Gen Xer may or may not work for a millennial or may not work for a baby boomer or Gen Z or Gen Y. So now that we have all these people working together and frankly, probably going to work together because no one can retire at 60 anymore. We're probably all going to be working too much later in our lives to afford our houses. Well, I could especially speak here for Canada. All these people were to come in and work together. How do they get work done? And it's not a better or worse. It's just what it is. And so when I first started working, my expectations of my employer was to pay me every two weeks. That's it. My nieces and nephews who are in their late 20s now have a very different perspective of what they want their, their organization to be about. Yes, pay me, but where's your flexibility? Where's your responsibility to the communities that we serve in? None of those things cross my mind. Am I a bad person? No, but I'm a Gen Xer. And at that time, it was a very different viewpoint of what was expectations are. Again, not a right or wrong, just different. So how do we bridge these generational you know, gaps and how do we work effectively on teams who have multiple generations in them? That's why I believe culture matters. I think it matters because it builds um, trust. It helps confronting conflict in real time. So it allows organizations uh, that, yes, it's nice that I can go to HR and talk about the problems I had with Elijah because he said something about my hair. But what if you had an organization where Elijah made a misstep and because I had some cultural understanding of where he came from, where I came from, that I can help mitigate that problem in real time without involving anyone else and him and I have a better relationship moving forward. That's how I envision the world organization is giving people the skill set to be able to confront conflict in a positive way and in, in, a, in a way that isn't um, soft gloving it, but is in a way that's going to move us forward. It helps break down our communication barriers and it ultimately helps build trust. We'll talk about building trust in, in, in a few moments. So what is culture? I kind of teased it earlier, but I want us to think of culture as more broad than Carlos is from Canada, his parents from Barbados, he's black, and he may or may not be religious. It's really about what is accepted and familiar for a particular group. That's a culture. So when you say it that way, then again, that could be culture for my finance team, it could be uh, for the executive suite, it could be for customer savers, it could be for my nurses, it could be for the community I live in. Uh, that's culture, the state, the country. So culture is more broad than that, okay? And so we have to think about what's accepted and familiar to us. That's what we consider to be culture. And it really affects the way we communicate and give feedback and interact socially with people. So 
if I can ask everyone to kind of zoom out, and I'll say that a lot too, is to zoom out and think about what culture is. So the culture is a shared pattern of beliefs and values and assumptions and behaviors that distinguish one group from another. Okay, I don't talk about color in there. There's no race in there. There's no country in there. That's what a culture is. So simply put, I would say to you, think of culture as the way we do things around here. Right. So think about it that way. Say you're on a team. And that's the way we do things on this team. And someone new comes in, say Carl's comes in and Carl's comes in with a different way of wanting to do things. How do you respond to Carlos? Is it open arms, warm and inviting his ideas? Or do we put a wall up against Carl's and say, what's this guy doing? He doesn't know how we do things around here. That's culture. Right. Another thing I like to talk about a lot is in neighborhoods and communities. You know, in Canada, I think North America, we pride ourselves on having these big, these houses with big lawns with green grass that we cut every Saturday. But a lot of my South Asian friends will come over here and they come from a place where that is not their cultural value to have this lawn that I must cut every Saturday uh, when I could be spending with my kids. I'm going to turn my front lawn into a place where I grow things or pavement. That person isn't trying to devalue the neighborhood. Their cultural values are different than ours. And so those are the kind of things that I think when you think about a hot button topic, it gives you a different perspective of the way to think about it. They're not trying to attack me. They're not trying to mold or move me from a different position. They're just different than I am. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, so there's a framework to culture. I just talked about one of them. So it's a shared pattern and beliefs that we have. That's culture. There's also your cultural identity, right? Where do I feel like I belong to a certain group? That could be, again, now we're talking about, okay, that could be a team. I'm in finance. I'm the finance representative of this organization, or I am black. I am Christian. I am Jewish. I am from this part of the U.S. I am Republican. I'm a dad. All those things become part of your cultural identity, which then, which then connects to your cultural values. What are my values and what are my principles as a person with my, my group? So that's kind of the framework of how of how culture works. And the reason why I keep beating this over the head is to kind of beat out, even though, and we'll talk about that in a second, nationality and race and gender, those things play into it. That's the framework. So when you think about someone who is transgender or who's a neurodiverse uh, person in terms of learning, uh, ableness, age, these are things that align with these people. This is what defines who they are, their culture, their cultural identity, how they feel in the belong and then the values that those things hold and that's where we start to get into these complex conversations which we'll always have on certain topics what's happened lately unfortunately we'll talk about this later is the fragmentation of our society and i'll i'll, I'll just leave that for the for the other slides um so let's talk about cultural differences and versus cultural values so cultural values are summaries of descriptions i would say of different ways that we approach life work, building relationships and communicating. That's our values. So we got our culture, we got our cultural identity, our cultural values and principles, and that affects the way we communicate and see and how we color the world. Okay. I grew up in Scarborough, very multicultural, got to live and work with a lot of people who didn't look like me, learned different languages. Unfortunately, as boy, learned a lot of different languages that were not good words. So I know a lot of Greek words, but not, not words I could say here on the screen, just in case someone is Greek. They're all bad words because we're, we're boys, that's what we do. But that's the stuff that I learned Versus someone who could have grown up in Alberta, here in Ontario, which is more rural or more or more north in my province, who didn't have the opportunity to meet someone like myself and only grew around a group of people who look like them. So when they meet up with someone like me who has different values, it's they don't might not know what to do with it, right? We'll get more into that later, but that doesn't mean they're right or wrong. It's just that it's different. And so those are the values of the culture. How do I work with people? How do I approach life? Um, how do I communicate with people? The differences are those things I just talked about, right? The background noise, our nationality, my age, my job function, what I do. These things are less important um, in some ways. But like what I mean by that is the values themselves are not, they're less important. They're important, but they're less important. What we want to talk about here is the way the values influence the way that we interact and communicate. So what I mean by that is just because you meet someone who's black and who's Canadian, and we're talking about some kind of um, characteristics of those people in a minute, it isn't the the set all, right? So for instance, we'll talk about this in a sec. In America, so in North America, in Canada as well, we're a very individualistic country. But that doesn't mean that there's people in within our country who are very, uh, who are who are individuals, but also very concerned about 
people beyond themselves. So it's not uh, a way to kind of define people, but it's a way as we start to navigate and meet new people to collect information, to try to understand how to communicate more effectively with somebody. It's just a piece of information. It's not all of it. Okay, hopefully I, I didn't butcher that and that makes sense. So Carlos, talk to me about culture and talk about culture clusters. So how do you figure these things out? So there's two ways to look at it. There's the, uh, I would say more of a international or global view of clusters and then a more domestic one. There's no right or wrong. I think both inform us in the way that we navigate and communicate. I think they're both very important. So from a global perspective, there's 10 kind of large clusters. Now they don't touch on every single country in the world, but there are where the majority of some of these cultural values really take hold um, uh, and, and show themselves. Again, this doesn't define people. Just because you're Canadian or American doesn't mean you have to be this or you are this. It just means as a society, there's more value placed in X thing versus the other ones, if that makes sense. So there's 10 clusters out in the world. So when we talk about Anglo, we're talking about people, and don't worry, you have to write this down, and this is being recorded, and I could send information later, but there's Anglo is Australian, Canadian, Ireland, New Zealand, UK, and the US, okay? We talk about Latin Europe, we're talking about French, uh, French Canada, so for those who don't know, uh, we are a bilingual country, we have one province here in uh, Quebec, where there are French and English speaking people, the more deeper you go in Quebec, it's really, really French, but French is their first language. And so as now as a prime minister of our country, you cannot be a prime minister in our country and not be able to speak both English and French. You learn English and French in school. Um, and so it's a very, very bilingual country. So there's French Canada, which is a little different in terms of their cultural values, even from people in Canada, the next province over. So I'm in Ontario and just next to me is Quebec. A lot of similarities, both Canadian, but also vastly different. Okay. Nordic, you can figure that out. Um, Denmark, Finland, Norway, um, Germanic is going to be Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Eastern European, um, think of Russia, Poland, Latin America, Brazil, Argentina, uh, Middle East, Arabs, um, Africa, um, Zimbabwe, Zdenia, um, Southern Asia, uh, India, and then of course, Confusion Asia, which is China and Japan. So again, these are kind of the global clusters, and there's certain ways of working and communicating that they have, generally speaking. So again, this is all just information gathering as we try to figure out how to navigate people who are from different places than ourselves. From a domestic perspective, there's five clusters. And a lot of this work um, has only really been done in, in America. Um, I, we use the US consensus for that, not as much work done here in Canada. And so the five in, in domestically would be um, African-Americans, uh, Asian Americans, Caucasians, Hispanics, and Latin Americans, and then Native Americans. And so again, the reason why these clusters are important is just you just want to understand how people view and see the world. Not a right or wrong. It doesn't mean if you're on one spectrum and they're on the other spectrum that you can't communicate with them or you can't get along. What we're trying to do here is drive self-awareness within ourselves around others so we can communicate and effectively lead better. Okay, so those are kind of the clusters. So now let's talk about a little bit about what cultural values are. And one of the biggest cultural values, and I'm not going to go through all of them. There's there's 10 of them. But for the purpose of today, I'm not going to go through all of them with you um, um, and for our time. But I want to talk about some of the ones that are, are really important that kind of give you a highlight. So one of the cultural values that are, and probably the most important one in the world, is the difference between uh, an individualistic perspective on the world and a collectivism perspective of the world. And so when you think about this, um, this is where America, North America, specifically the United States, is we consider the most individualistic country in the world, right? Stand up for your rights, emphasize on my individual rights, my desire to solve things myself, be responsible for myself, I'll take care of this, that kind of thing. Collectivism, you would probably say the most collectivistic uh, country in the world would be somewhere like China. Again, that doesn't mean in the U.S. that we don't have collectivist people and vice versa. It just means the dominant culture. That's what we're looking for. So what do these two things mean? Individual is really about emphasizing on my individual goals and my achievements and my rights. Collectivism is more about group goals, personal relationships, and things like that. Now, does that mean someone who's individual doesn't care about personal relationships? Of course not. It doesn't. It just means when I think about doing something, I'm thinking about the impact of how it happens to a group or to everyone else before I think of myself. And so in America, you will look at um, someone uh, 
uh, you know, uh, I think the the in Caucasians are considered the most individualistic people in America, uh, while African Americans, Asian Americans, Latin Americans are more on the collectivist side. Why is this important? Once you start to understand these things, you start to look at different situations, to me, differently. Again, these are no right and wrongs. That doesn't mean that you can't slide on scale depending on what it is that you do. It just gives you a snapshot, okay? The other one that's really important is the way we communicate with each other. How direct or indirect are we gonna be? Okay, so we have two communication styles when it comes to cultural values, indirect, indirect. So when you're a low context person, you want explicit communication, words matter, okay? If you're indirect, it's more about tone. What are they trying to say? What does that look like? And you would think in somewhere like America, Canada, we're a very direct um, cultural values country. We are, but then we're not with certain other things. And I'll give you a very quick example. If you're giving feedback to an employee, generally speaking, we call someone in your office, we want to give them feedback. We want to talk about five things. Four of those things are either these great things that they're doing, double down on it, continue that. And then at the end, we do the kicker of, well, this is something that is an area of opportunity, something you should work on, right? That's generally how we do things in North America. So that's, so we consider that to be direct. But if you grow up in France, where tone matters, they look at that and say, oh my God, they just said four things that are great about me and only one bad thing. I'm killing it. But we know our intent is we're telling you four things that you're amazing at, one that you're not so good at, and we really want you to think, focus on the one, but we don't actually say it. We don't set it up that way. So depending on who you're talking to, they're going to leave that room and be like, I'm a star or I'm really struggling. And so these are things that you want to think about when you're talking to the people, right? Think about the way we communicate um, with, with teachers and students um, um, and other things, right? Like what's our communication style? What's our cultural value? Use. Uh, what you might consider rude or bent might just be the way that those people communicate. And so if you're a high context person, you might think someone who's low context is blunt and rude. And if you're a low context person, you might someone think of someone who's high context is evasive or aloof, not really caring. But none of those, things, those two things are true. But if you understand what those things are in real time, you start to understand that Carlos isn't speaking up in the meeting not because he doesn't care, but because he communicates the way he feels about the way we should finish this project or communicate with someone in a different way, if that makes any sense. And the last one I wanna talk about really quickly is one that really affects collaboration in teams, which is low uncertainty and avoidance and high uncertainty and avoidance. So, you know, when you think of low uncertainty and avoidance, that's people who just says things like, I love a new challenge, let's go do it. Let's break something, let's go, right? technology sectors, probably like that, other places. Then you go to other places where it's more around healthcare or maybe teachers. It's a little bit more of, mm, I'm not sure. I avoid it's like, hey, I'm willing to do something, but I need to know the reasons why. I prefer reasoning, framework, what's happening here. So think about having a team where two people work together and they're on opposite sides of this, right? This could potentially be one of the, the challenges of the team getting some things done because the other person thinks that person never wants to take any risks. They have no no gumption for anything where the other person thinks, my God, that person's erratic. They always want to try something new and break something. They're not responsible, but that's not true. They're just willing to challenge things. So what happens when you get those two people in a room and understand the differences and understand you start to move yourself across the scale? What's going to take to get a high uncertainty, important, high uncertainty person to kind of move along closer to a low uncertainty and vice versa? You do that through dialogue and just through self-awareness. So it's really, really, really important. Um, um, yeah, so that's a, that's a really important one I also want to talk about as well. So ultimately, what does cultural values reveal? I'm just going to check my time, make sure I've got enough time. Great. Um, it really just gives us a general orientation towards our life, our work, and the way we form relationships, okay? It also helps us, as we just talked about, uncover potential biases that we might have towards someone else who's a different culture than our own, right? So I'll tease this up here. I love unconscious bias training. I think it's really important. But what I find really troubling with most of it out there and most organizations, when they call me up, that's the first thing they want me to do. And I generally usually start off by saying no, is that they just want me to give you a list. Halo effect, you know, um, uh, explicit bias, great. But no one cares about the titles. And what you want to understand is what are the mechanisms that create bias? And that's what we focus on is the things that create it for you. And cult not understanding cultural values is one of them. 
then you put in real life experiences that happen to all of us, which is time restraint, pressure, fatigue, um, and distractions, and all those things manifest into our biases. We all have them anyways. And then, you know, because we don't know the mechanisms, but I know the list of all the bias words, that is nothing for me moving forward in terms of how do I develop it. So how am I aware of my time, my pressure, my distractions, and understanding what the problems I'm trying to solve and who I'm trying to solve them with helps you reduce and recognize your blind spots. But what it doesn't do, just to be clear, doesn't predict your ability to work effectively across cultures, okay? It's a starting point, um, but really having, this is where cultural intelligence comes in. If you start to understand your own curiosity, um, your own knowledge, your own strategy, and the way you could pivot, the way you do things, that's what cultural intelligence does once you understand what the cultural value is, values are. So just having them isn't cultural intelligence. It's just part of the educational piece, if that makes sense. Um, so let's go, let's go back to DEI, right? It's been a big thing happening for, for probably 10 years now, but especially in the last couple of years since, since the murder of George Floyd. A, a lot of, like I said, a lot of organizations call me, Carl, hey, I saw you talking or someone recommended you. I want you to come in next Tuesday and do a bias training. And I always say no. What, is, what are we doing the bias training for? What's the problem that we're trying to solve? It might not even be bias to start. That might be part of the training, but we'll get there. But what is it? And so really what I want to talk about really quickly here is diversity, equity, inclusion training is important. Diversity and representation is important. Having targets for these things are important. The challenge is, is it means nothing if you hire Fanny to come into your organization as a Black woman, you make her a senior executive, she brings her ideas and her thoughts into meetings, and she never gets them shared, uh, celebrated, rewarded, or acknowledged. If Fanny ends up leaving the organization, the organization, organization says, see, we try to do inclusion work, doesn't work. My point is having targets and understanding where you are is very important. But what is the working environment that you're creating? And this goes back to what I said earlier about hiring for culture fit. Because you have this tenet of what your culture is, which I believe that you believe that you want to be true. But is that actually the feeling of the people who work in the organization? And if it's not, then it's not your cultural. It's not your culture. It's just words. And so inclusion is where we kind of like to play the most. And that's why culture intelligence to me is important is inclusion gives you the, the ability for leaders and individuals to create an environment where people feel psychologically safe, feel valued and heard and can share their ideas in a way that's positive. It's very, very important. So equity is important. I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying, if you don't have the eye, if you don't have inclusion, then we don't have anything. It's very important that we look at our, and it's constant. It's a, it's a, it's a project that will never end. It will outlive me, all of us. We have to constantly review and see to make sure that we're having an environment that's inclusive and allows people to be who they are. If that makes sense. I also want to talk about the mindset really quickly of what culture is. Culture affects the way that we view and see the world. It colors our world. So it affects our communication, right? We have to understand this. It's a mindset. That's why we call the company the CQ mindset is because we know it's more than just the heart. I think DI is the right thing to do. I really do in my heart. But I understand that this work can't get done just through passion, just through my emotions. And here, there's got to be an acknowledgement of what this does. What's my thinking? Am I in rational thinking? Am I reactive thinking? How do I make my decisions? Who do I make my decisions with? Have I checked my blind spots? So it's a mental state, DI. You have to change the way we look at it. This isn't just about getting retribution or leveling the playing field. Yes, all those things are a part of it, but it's actually just the right thing to do. And it's the smart thing to do. We're trying to solve complex problems with the same three or four people. It doesn't matter how smart these people are. It's better to include the people from different perspectives so we can solve more complex problems, okay? Some value questions you could ask yourself if you're trying to figure out the culture that you have, right? You wanna talk about the human nature of this culture, right? Are we inherently trying to be good people here or bad people here? And I know that's a really slippery slope because what I might consider good, you might not consider good and all those kind of things. But I think we all can say when we look in the world now, and I hate to say this, but mostly in America, we talk about politics, when you are talking, are you actually trying to do something that's beneficial to this country with the acknowledgement that this country is diverse? Or are you just trying to get yourself and the people who agree with you explicitly ahead and moving forward? 
Okay. Those are the things. What's our human nature? What are we actually trying to do here? Are we trying to do any good around here? The other thing you want to think about is what is our attitudes towards nature? Nature could be actual nature, trees, yes, animals, but just people. Like, are we dependent on other people? Are we independent? Do we have power over the environment that we have that we're in? What are we looking at? Time is important. We're we talking about now, past, present, future. You know, when I hear the words, you know, do you understand when you say to someone, I want to make this thing great again? How for some people, that brings up another viewpoint than what you think it is. So maybe growing up for certain people at a certain time in the 50s or 60s are great. But I also know in your country, and my wife is Caucasian, I know growing up in your country 40 years ago in the 60s, it was illegal for me to marry my wife. So in the 60s, it might have been great for you. But I don't know if it would have been great for me. And was it great for people who look like me or for women who wanted to be senior exec? Like all these things. And so what's the time and space we're talking about here? And then space itself, right? What space man? Private, public? What, what, what are we talking about? And then active. How active am I? And we're talking about fragmentation in a second, but how active am I in society? Am I just present or am I actually doing stuff, creating things? Okay. And then how do we feel about our society? Are we more authoritarian? Are we more group focus, right? When it comes to terms of power. So those are some of the questions you want to ask when you think about creating a culture in an organization, your community, whatever that might be. Really quickly, I want to make sure I'm on time. I'm on time. Uh, the way we express our culture really quickly, there's, there's three ways. There's control, right? It's like, how do I convey my cultural context, and when you say to yourself, Carlos, what do you mean by control? Think about the individual culture. I talk about individualistic culture versus collectivist. How can I express myself? Versus in America, how can I express what I believe and how I feel and who makes me who I am versus someone who lives somewhere different? How can I do it? We both can express it, but there's probably some nuances there. My interaction, okay? Um, that's really about my group. How do we interact with each other? What, where do I feel home in my cultural values? And then ultimately, how do we express it? Through my dress, through my words, praying, whatever that may be. So when we think about expressing culture, right? All those things we talked about earlier in our values, they come out in these ways and they're affected by these things, the control, my interaction and the expression. I wanna talk a little bit quickly and I mentioned it earlier because I think it's really important about fragmentation. And what I mean by fragmentation is, is the way our culture now there's a phenomenon that's happening where we started to kind of fragment ourselves. And I think it's a com combination of technology, a combination of a lot of different things, but people started getting into groups. And even when I first started my consulting practice, people told me that they, what you want, people said to me, you know, what you want to do, Carlos, you want to find a tribe. You want to have the people follow your tribe. And I had a real problem with that. Um, I'm not knocking anybody who does that, but that's not what I want. I don't just want a bunch of like-minded people following me around you know, congratulating me. I want to have deep, meaningful conversations. And frankly, specifically with people who don't see the world the way I do, but we've been fragmented now, right? You're either left or you're right, either pro vaccination, you're not vaccination, you're either for police, or you're not. And we all know as the adults in the room that the world's way more gray than that. But the way things have happened, media and, and, and social media, it's fragmented us into this way where we used to have this common kind of general understanding of things and it's been fragmented. And so culture right now is really, really more important for that reason, because it allows us to zoom out. And what I mean by that, and I'll give a quick example. If you could have an argument with somebody, and I had this conversation actually, uh, Fanny, not with Fanny, but with someone at the conference where we were at, I can argue to someone's blue in the face about the, about the right of, 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 of someone who um, is male to marry another male right? Gay marriage, right? You could have that argument. Um, but if you just focus on that argument, it's just going to be that argument. What we need to do is zoom out and understand, and it's people's rights to be pro and against something. Now, you could be against gay marriage. You can't tell someone they can't be a CEO or can't have a job or can't live somewhere because of their sexuality. But you yourself as a person, if you choose could say, hey, that's, I don't, I believe in something different. That's your right. But we, can we agree? And I don't agree. I agree some, I think of something different, but can we agree that what we don't want is a society, a society that uh, creates or incentivizes or feels comfortable with someone walking into a nightclub and shooting people because they're gay. Can we agree on that? We probably could. 
And so what I mean by that is we have to start to zoom out of our conversations. That doesn't mean that you can't be passionate about what you're into and, and, and express that. But if you get bogged down into these, these arguments, we're never, it's never going to happen. We're never going to have, everyone's never going to think the exact same way about every single thing. But there's things that we can think about and talk about. And that comes through dialogue. And dialogue means actually talking to Carlos, not around Carlos, not through him, not having a panel on CNN or Fox News, but really having conversations with people. That's how we get through. And that's how we kind of break down fragmentation. Um, I, I won't talk too much about the process. I actually think I just did. But what I, what I mean to say this is that, listen, we have to remember our humanity. If you look at all of our DNAs across this entire planet, 99 point whatever percent of it is the same. That doesn't mean we don't celebrate our differences. I talked about the plastic couch earlier, but we're the same. And we spend so much time talking about our differences. We got to find ways to find common ground. If we don't, what's been happening in the last five or six years, eight years, is going to continue to go, to go in, in a negative way. And I'm going to talk about something really quick here if I have the time. I want to talk about vaccinations really quick. It's very easy for me, someone, and I'll, I'll say this to someone who's pro-vaccination. I've got stabbed, I don't know how many times that it's easy to just say people who are anti-vaccinators are the crazy ones, right? They're just crazy. They're the ones on the internet, they're just crazy. And there's a portion of those people in there. But if you actually do the research and talk to people and learn about this, most of those people are people who, unfortunately, especially in, in America, unlike Canada, don't have healthcare, they don't have insurance, they don't have a family doctor. And the messaging that came across about when to wear a mask, when not to wear a mask, what, uh, what shot you should take, what not shot, was very confusing. And then you throw in there, depending on where you're in the country, low income, social economic stand, I don't know what to do. And I don't have anyone to go and ask. And I'm scared of COVID and I'm scared of the shot. Those are the most, those are a lot of the people. But what we do, because it's easy, is to just say those are the crazy people who belong, who attack the hill and I'm over here. And it's always never, it's never, ever that simple. And so all I'm saying is, is, is go across, reach out to someone, have a conversation. You start to learn that what they're probably angry about isn't actually what they're angry about, it's something else. And we have to find ways to get through to have deeper, meaningful conversations. I just wanted to kind of just highlight that really quick. Carlos, and this goes time. back to- Keep, keep going, don't, don't worry about the time. Jim. Okay, per perfect. So the other thing uh, this all leads to is our fundamental problem with talking to people who are strangers. A stranger could be someone who's from a different state. We talked about culture earlier, someone who's new to a team, someone who's moved into your neighborhood, uh, someone who's older or younger than you, or you're a millennial, you expect to be CEO because you're a millennial, or you're a baby boomer, you ruined my country and my world and my nature, whatever that may be, right? We have problems when we talk to strangers. And the problem that we have with talking to strangers is that we overestimate our ability to read people and how they're thinking and they're feeling. We apply our own cultural values to that person. So in North America, we see shock as someone who goes, or wide-eyed, whatever, very facial expression. That's shock, right? Just go watch a Friends episode. It's the most overacted, no offense to my Friends people out there, but the most overacted show ever. You could tell, right? You can watch that show on mute and know that that person's shocked right now. But in other culture, that's not how they express their shock and all. So think about a time in your life where you communicated something with somebody and they gave you nothing, right? Think about the times where there's really high pressure interactions between police officers and people in the public square. What cultural values do both those people bring to that moment as a police officer, as someone from a certain cultural value, ethnicity, background, social economics, what do they bring to that inter inter interaction? And then what do they apply to each other in that interaction in real time. My hope and my point is, is that if we start to understand that we're overestimating our ability, right? That we start to understand that we're actually not that good at reading people as we think we are. The other problem that we have, and I, well, I should just mention both, those are the two problems, so that we don't understand uh, people's emotions and what they're thinking, we just don't. And we don't understand the way they express things. And so it's really under, it's important to understand, and my next slide will show that, uh, with the cultural value around how non-expressive and expressive people are, right? I'm a person using my hands a lot, probably did a lot on this call, my apologies in advance, smiled a lot, tried to, you know, that's where I come from. 
So me interacting with someone who's non-expressive and they're giving me nothing, I'm like, what's, ha what's happening here? Are they disappointed? Are they not interested? Does it not make sense? Are they hating me right now? They just come from a different cultural value. In Canada and US, we're kind of in the middle here of this, of this cultural value, all right? But if you go to J Japan, they're high on the non-expressiveness, right? And then you go somewhere like in the Caribbean or South America, it's very expressive. And so it's really important when we start thinking about just everyday work, it's important. But I think when we start thinking about the, the complex conversations that we're having right now, about how as a healthcare provider, do I provide services for someone who doesn't speak the language or comes from a different cultural value where uh, as a woman, I'm not allowed to touch her, but I need to because I need to understand what's happening, right? This isn't someone coming over my country to take over and change. It's a different cultural value. And so what if we armed our police force to understand and to go into communities that it doesn't have the same cultural value and how to navigate. How do we talk to that community about, hey, this is how we navigate, right? Throw money in the ways at that organization that helps give them skills, right? We've got that covered. You know how to shoot a gun, you know how to protect yourself, but really what you want is to be able to walk up to a car and if there's gonna be a heightened level of a situation which you can't control, how do you bring that temperature down? So you don't have to shoot somebody or vice versa. Where, where is that coming in? And we don't hear that because we get bogged down with, well, you're left, you're right, you're pro. And it's not about that. It's I just want this interaction to go the way that it's supposed to go. And so knowing these things are very, very important uh, in the way that we talk and navigate with each other. Um, and so this is where cultural intelligence comes in. I mentioned earlier, it's, you know, culture values is that stepping point to understanding, but then the cultural intelligence part gives you this framework to understand how to navigate a situation where I'm doing a presentation or talking to someone and someone gives me nothing back emotionally, physically, I don't see it. How do I navigate that? You know, it's the, it's really the first step of, of the CQ is a, your awareness. So see, you know, knowing your cultural values, is your awareness, but not how I apply it. And so the way cultural intelligence works really quickly here is there's four key components. There's 13 sub-dimensions, which we will not get into today. If I get invited back and you guys don't put me off the stage, we'll talk about it. But for now, we'll we're be invited back. We'll talk about, thank you. We'll talk about the four. So what's my drive? What is my level of interest and persistence and confidence in multiple and in multicultural interactions? And let me preference all of this before I start the other three by saying there's no right or wrongs here. It is just what it is. If your level of interest is not high in multicultural interactions, you're not a racist. You're not a bad person. It just it was never needed in your world. I didn't need to. Everyone in the neighborhood looked just like me. I never needed to flex that muscle. So I'm good. But now I'm in a situation where I need to. And no one's giving me the skill. Let's be honest. Most people get their job, their promotions, because they know how to do the actual job they're promoted for. You're great at Excel. You know numbers. Great. What they don't be are taught is how to lead, right? Leadership's about inspiration. It's about coaching. It's about um, uh, being insightful, being empathetic, listening, encouraging, developing talent. That is hard to teach. And we don't. We just give someone a title and let them go at it and then wonder why they fail. So drive is about your interest, right? Do you see value in meeting and talking to people who are different than you? If you don't, you're not bad. It's just what what is it for you? So we can start to develop it. What's your knowledge of different people? Now, you don't need to have an encyclopedia on Barbados and understand who the, our prime ministers are and what our food is, but it doesn't. But what I'm trying to say is, is the knowledge part is where our cultural values come in. That's knowledge. Oh, I know what this could be, right? I understand that Carl's comes from Canada and in Canada do things a little bit differently. How can I go about finding more about how Carl's works and how he navigates as he fits into our team. That's where the knowledge piece, piece comes in. So you don't have to be an expert in every culture in the world. It's just cultural values is one of those, those skill sets. What's my strategy then now? So now that I know that Carlson and I are different, how am I going to navigate this conversation? He's high avoidance, I'm low um, unavoidance. How are we to work this through, right? And then your action. Your action is a place that we get really bogged down with because action is really about how do I adapt? And I always get this in training. People say to me, why do I have to adapt? They came over here. They came on our team. They're new. Why are we adapting? And I get that. And I always tell people, and I said this is one gentleman who's actually 
quite irate um, about that. And so this is the problem with DEI is that people are asking me to change and I don't want to change. And I simply just said to him, I asked him if he had a, a grandparent and he said, yes. <clears throat> and I said, you know, how many do you have? And he said, I have, you know, I have only one left. Others passed away. I said, yeah, me too. I have, I have one now. I, unfortunately, I have, I have none. And I said, well, how are, how are they in health? And they said, well, you know, she's good, but she's, she's really, really hard of hearing, right? So her hearing's going really, really bad. And it's, it's been, it's, it's difficult, right? Christmas parties and a Christmas coming over all that, it's too much noise for her. It's not very good. I said, that's interesting. I said, okay. So I said, when you talk to your grandmother, do you talk to her the way that you would talk to me? And he's like, well, what do you mean? I said, well, your tone, your volume, is it the same? He's like, no, I, I slow down. And I, and I make sure my, my volume's a little bit higher because she's, she's really hard of hearing. I want her to see my words, really take in what I'm saying. I said, okay, cool. So you're adapting then. And then he, he said, I, I see what you're doing. Because we do that, right? We do that for our loved ones. We'll adapt. We'll adapt to a grandparent. We'll adapt to children. We'll, we will find ways to adapt the way we communicate with somebody uh, all the time. But you put the lens around DI around it or something like that, the people are like, oh my God, now you want me to change. You want me to be more, more left, more right. No, 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 no. I'm just saying we all adapt all the time. It happens. You don't want to lose who you are. We're not asking you to lose who you are. All I'm asking you for is to adapt. So someone's coming to you, a healthcare worker who doesn't have great English and needs help. Are you going to adapt? Right? You're going to adapt. You're going to try to find a way to get the information out. Is it through written word? Is it through a translator? Is it through how are you going to do it? So adaption isn't about adoption isn't about changing who you are, changing your cultural values. It's just a pivot. We pivot all the time. It's just a pivot to get what we want to get done, which is effective communication, a police interaction that doesn't end with anybody's death, uh, a, a student and a teacher getting through a, a situation where there's no violence uh, occurring. Like, this is what we want. There needs to be some sort of of, of adaption, adoption, I should say. Okay, so that's those are the four, kind of the four quadrants of, of cultural intelligence. And what it does, it gives you another strategy, it gives you perspective taking. And so I said earlier about the bookends of curiosity. So when I think of curiosity, I think of, you know, the drive part of CQ. And then when I think of, of empathy, I think of when I think of strategy, I think of empathy, curiosity, and empathy, it's about perspective taking, it's literally, literally, taking myself and putting myself from your perspective. So we go back to the argument about being vaccinated or unvaccinated or supporting gay marriage or not. It's not about agreeing, but can I understand for you why this conversation is important? This change is important. This, this, this effect to you is important. I'm mandating everybody has to come back to the office uh, without asking anybody the impact of it. Perspective taking is trying to figure out what does this impact mean for people, making them come back to the office or working remotely or whatever that may be. Vaccinations versus unvaccinated. It's perspective taking. And that helps you mitigate our biases. You have to try to see things from different people's lens. It doesn't mean you agree with them. It just means that you're showing some empathy. I understand that this is a challenge for you, right? So it really helps manage your bias. And, and I'll, I'll quickly show you how. So when you think about uncertainty and avoidance, right? Say you're a moderate person and you work people who are whole, high and low. The first thing you ask yourself is what kind of biases might other people in this group have towards me in this area? And what do I have towards them in this area? Okay. What is some skills that I can use to kind of figure this, this out in a different way than the way that I've been doing it that's been ineffective? And I won't talk about them today. We might do this if I, if I come back, but one of the things I like to talk about is a, is a process called reframe, say, ask, ask. And so what I mean by that is whatever argument you're trying to solve, whether an argument with a person or a problem trying to solve in your organization is reframe the argument in an attempt to identify a third option. If your option is to convince Carlos to be pro or anti X, I would argue that you need to reframe that because that, that's, not, that's not the purpose, right? Um, the purpose is to acknowledge that I exist, respect my rights. That's, that's what we really want. I don't need, if you convert, that's great, but that's not the goal. So you don't want to say something different. So rather than choosing between this or that, let's list some positive attributes of this way of doing things, low uncertainty or high uncertainty, then ask about options. What are there other ways we can solve this problem? What's, who else can we leverage to help solve this problem? 
right? Who else can come in here and help kind of mitigate what we're trying to talk about? And what you start to find is a lot of things are not, as we always assume, and I think we all know as adults, it's not black and white. There is another way to talk about this um, that is beyond the rhetoric, the name calling, the putting people in a box, the canceling people, the whatever you want to call it. There's another way we can do things. So reframe, say your problem out loud in a different way, choose another way of thinking about it and ask a bunch of questions and then rinse, repeat that situation, that process over and over again until you get to a solution that you think is going to be, that's going to work. So it's really about reframing. Um, and just to end off here, because I think, you know, I'm getting close to time is, is, is what it does for us from a biased perspective, right? So think about your cultural values. Now think about someone's facial expressions. Think about it in a situation where you talk to somebody and they give you nothing back. Or you ask someone for a bunch of feedback and you got feedback from Elijah and you got nothing back from Fanny. And you're like, what the hell? Like, think about that. Unconscious, right? How explicit are you? Are you sensitive towards people who are pro or anti, like, oh my, anti-vaxxers? I, I can't, I can't, I can't deal. Like, we have to think about these things and think about them bigger than, um, than someone's skin tone and their actions or their affiliations. But what's the values here? Okay. And what I mean by that, and I'll give you a real quick example at the end is, you know, and I, I know it's more of a corporate speech here, but I think it's important, right? You got a leader who's frustrated with his team. They're not getting something done. They're, they're having arguments. I don't understand. I don't understand. That's his perspective. They're not getting their work done. I've given him a directive. What's the problem? If he puts on perspective taking, right? If he starts to understand their cultural values, starts using some of his cultural intelligence, he starts to ask some questions. He starts to reframe the problem that he's trying to solve that, okay, what I want, right? Instead of being bogged down with why aren't they getting stuff done, right? Why I just ask them to do something, they're not doing it. Think about what's happening with them individually as a group that's not making this work. And I won't read these all to you, but everyone's got different perspectives. Some people want to be managed and have a goal and like, tell me what to do. Other people say, why does he need to just tr trust us to finish the work? And some people think, oh my God, why do we meet so much? We're meeting all the time. I just want to get down to do it. Like what I'm trying to say is that people, we do a very bad job of understanding people's perspective just because we think we do, right? You're wearing a suit, I'm wearing a suit. I know we're on the same team, I get it. No, there's a lot going on within your group. So what you want to do is you want to observe more. This is something that's missing. This is why I don't watch CNN. Or these, there's just panels of people and no one's observing anything, right? Oh, there's anti-vaxxers. Okay, it's easy, right? It's easy. Even things that I don't agree with, marching on Capitol, same thing happened here in Ontario. I know people were like, God, I, I can't support those people. I said, I don't, I don't either, but I want to be interested. I'm interested in what's observing what's happening here. What is this coming from? They're holding, I hate Justin Trudeau signs, but it's more than that. It's more than the vaccine. What's happening here? You need to actually observe. Are you looking at your team? Are you always in an office meeting with the executives and you're making this decision that your team's not getting done? Are you observing? Are you actively listening? Like actively listening? Like I could be doing a talk right now, listen to you. My kids can come home and I could hear them downstairs talking. I hear them. I know they're home, but I'm not really listening to the conversations that they're having. Are you actively? listening to your team, to your customers, to the people that you support, to your colleagues, like fully listening. I think all of us can tell a time where we've gone and done a one-on-one -on -one with one of our bosses or managers, and they're on their laptop typing away or on a phone, trying to have a one-on-one -on -one with me and said, I got to wrap this thing up. Like they're not actively interested. They could say they are, but they're not. Cause if they were like I've done with this phone call, I've turned off my cell phone. I've turned off my Apple watch because I'm here talking to everyone here today. That's it. If there really is a fire, my wife will knock on the door and she'll tell me and then I'll have to tell all of you, I'm sorry, there's a fire or my kid, whatever, I got to go. But for now, I'm disconnected. I'm not distracted. And then you got to check your assumptions and we all have them. We all have them. So perspective taking is about those things. Personality, circumstance, the organizational structure. What's the power struggle here? What's the cultural values? Where do they sit and I sit? This helps us mitigate our biases, not just learning all the types of biases. Those help identify. But what, how, what do I do now to root them out is you got to have some perspective taking.
right? You got to understand and educate yourself about the way people work and see the world better as you see it, but also how the other people see it as well. Carlos, this, this yes. has been so phenomenal. Yes. I, listen, I'm so sorry. Oh my God. No, so that's good. good. I'm done um, now. I'm done. So that, that's a wrap. Um, so I hope I left you with that piece to perspective taking and, and yes, I've, I've eaten up too much time. So thank you. You, you have not eaten up anything. It's just everybody. You just, the comments are phenomenal. Just totally phenomenal. Oh, good, we I didn't can. get to a couple of questions, but I'd like to sure. send them to you. Sure. To respond to them. And then we will get that to the audience, but I can tell you this was phenomenal. And I beg of you to come back. I promise you, sure. audience, whoever is on, you have not seen, this is not the last time you're going to see Carlos. Oh, I appreciate this that. was so phenomenal. I see a series here. I really do. Mm. Uh, because there were so many valuable um, components to this presentation. Um, I want to thank you. This was phenomenal. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you came and provided this amazing presentation. You will be back because we're going to invite you. And for everyone who took time from their day to spend this hour with us, we want to say thank you because you could have spent your time anyplace else, but you chose to spend it with us. Thank you so much. And we will be seeing you soon. Carlos, thank you again. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everyone. I'm sorry I took up too much time. If you have any mm -hmm. questions, please get those questions, send them to me. I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much, everyone. Be, be thank good. Thank you. And no apology necessary. Mm -hmm. That was phenomenal. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to stop. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Thanks, everyone.